the Superhero Rundown. I'm Lady Jess, and today we are looking at the first 12 episodes of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. The premise is pretty simple. Phil, son of Cole, is getting a team together to investigate things the Avengers will not slash cannot slash just won't because science bros slash the usual excuse, but none of the Avengers actually know he survived the Battle of New York because of Nick Fury. As for characters besides Phil, we have Melinda May, a no-nonsense woman who doesn't like her nickname the Cavalry, but stands by Coulson because she trusts him. Grant Ward, professional agent who thinks that not being a team player makes him likable. Spoiler alert, it doesn't. Fitz, a scientist who, along with Simmons, a biochemist, create the team's science department and are friggin' adorable. And Sky, who comes in episode one, a hacker with awesome skills at reading people unless she's sleeping with them. Now a lot of you are probably wondering, why do I call him Phil, son of Cole, and how am I actually going to be doing this? Well, the answer to the first question is pretty easy. It's because I love Thor, but for the sake of the episode, I'm going to be referring to him as Agent Coulson, Coulson, Agent, or whatever. The second is a bit more complicated. See, this series is an experiment to help me develop ideas for my master's thesis. So I need to look at the overarching issues that are actually relevant to our world. Fear, relationships, corporations, terrorism, morality, and humanity are among some of the things we will be talking about. In order to understand the Marvel Cinematic Universe and why we love it so much, we need to identify some of the issues they've had at play here. Now I'm going to do overviews, nothing fancy, just discussing how certain things in the episodes can be pertained to whatever issue we're actually discussing. So suit up! This is the first 12 episodes of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. In the very first episode, we see something most parents and kids can identify with a father and son. It doesn't matter if it was a positive relationship for those people, but they can identify with Mike Peterson and his son Ace. We identify with what it means to be a kid and what it means to be a parent, especially when it's revealed that Mike Peterson is a superpowered being who can climb walls. How do you show your kid your powers, or do you keep them? Do you stay away from him for his safety because who knows what crazy people will try to kidnap him, exchange him for Agent Coulson, and then blow you up? And how do you try to make amends when you think he thinks you're a monster because of your actions at Union Station? Even during Mike's speech on government, he's thinking he can use his superpowers for the greater good, to make bad people answer for what they've done. Think that means anything? I know you got men everywhere waiting to put me down. I know how this plays out. I don't. I know you got poison in your system. I know it's burning you up. Mike, the last guy who wore that exploded. I'm not like that other guy. I'm... It matters who I am inside, if I'm a good person, if I'm strong. I have a clear shot. Do you copy? I know you're strong. Your boy knows it. He needs you to let us help. You took him. You took my wife, my job, my house. You think this is killing me? All over. There's people being pushed down, being robbed. One of them tries to stand up. You gotta make an example out of him. You bring this building down on us. Will that help them? That's a lie! All you do is lie! You said if we worked hard, if we did right, we have a place. And because of that, we see how Mike Peterson thinks about his superpowers as a parent. To be quite honest, I thought he was Luke Cage when I first saw him. Yeah, he had a son, but Coulson didn't even exist in comics until Clark Gregg played him in the movie, so why can't you change the origin story? Anyway, this bit of heroics makes you wonder a thing or two. The whole innocent bystander motif and whose job it is to actually help. Do you just sit there and take pictures of a burning building with your smartphone? Or do you feel the adrenaline spike and go save someone because it's the right thing to do and who cares about your health? If you have superpowers, the answer is obviously yes. Unless you're a supervillain. But if you don't, it's more of a danger thing. For example, not to pull on any heartstrings, but how about the rescue workers of 9-11? Hell, Steve Buscemi, yes, Nucky Thompson Steve Buscemi, went back to his old ladder company and helped out after the attacks. Not for publicity, and not for the fact that he was a celebrity. No, because it was the right thing to do. And all those rescue workers who saved some of those people from a building falling on them, and in return lost their lives saving people? Yeah, there's a reason they are called the real heroes. Hell, this scene from The Avengers is a great example. Captain America is tired and catching his breath, but what are the cops of New York doing instead of hiding from the Chitauri? They're helping people to safety and assisting the Avengers. They don't care that death is a possibility. Their job is to serve and protect. 
Though, to be fair, that issue has been brought up of late, but it's not appropriate to talk about for this episode. Now, before we get to the nitty-gritty of morality and whatnot, I would like to say something about all the superhero references. There are a lot of them, and yes, part of it is tying Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and some of the questions are even interesting, like, is Thor really a god? That's a question that the Ultimate Universe asked at some point. Hulk, Iron Man, Captain America, and even Loki are mentioned. And it stands to reason that if these superheroes are mentioned, can a hero be separated from his humanity? In the Avengers, it's evident that sometimes you just need to eat, whether you're a god, a billionaire, an assassin, a woman, a scientist, a soldier, or anyone else. But according to Centipede, this show's evil organization before Hydra appears, you can be separated from it and turned into a monster who just kind of destroys everything until you blow up. And even Sky mentions this to Mike Peterson in the first episode. With great power comes a ton of weird crap that you are not prepared to deal with. Sure, it's a spin on the Spider-Man cliche, but it can be attributed to college graduates my age who are trying to find jobs, who are trying to make ends meet after they acquire their BA, and then a bunch of stupid shit happens and they find themselves living with their mom again while they go for their master's thesis. You know, people who work for a living then get screwed out of their job, then find out that their new job needs a master's degree, and then the never-ending cycle of paying more money to get an education, but that puts you in more debt thing happens. Look, I'm making it a lot worse than it is for the sake of argument. I have friends who found a good job after getting a BA. I have friends who are lawyers, dentists, actors, stage managers, directors, and even food workers. You don't have to be ashamed of what your job is or even what your education is. Because Son of Cole is right. The essence of a hero is not the superpowers. It's doing what's right for the good of the people. You know, like his idol, Captain America. Speaking of Captain America, let's talk about fear and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Starting with the most prevalent thing, the 084s. It's an object of unknown origin, reflecting that because we have no classification for it, we send in the secret spy organization to determine if it's a threat or not. See that? They don't determine if it's safe, they determine if it's a threat first and if they need to neutralize it. That's a little terrifying when you put it that way. Then, if you determine that they should be locked away, who actually is benefiting here? Because if it's dangerous, shouldn't it be destroyed? What if someone who's powerful and dangerous knows you have it and tries to go get it, succeeding in obtaining such a weapon slash dangerous thing? Who do you blame? Because you put it there in the first place. So is the responsibility of your determining the unknown object to be dangerous your fault? But what if your powers are the dangerous thing? How do we get around that? In one episode, they even bring up the question of powers being demons that haunt you, and it turns out ghosts protecting you because love, but it does bring up some relevant questions that one should explore. How does religion factor into superpowers? We have Jewish superheroes, Muslim superheroes, atheist superheroes, Christian superheroes, and even Jainist superheroes. We also have pagans and gods and other races of superpowered beings. But what if those individuals don't actually want their abilities? What do you do? This woman didn't want the ability she thought she had. Powers can be a burden. Imperfect. Tony Stark does have problems with his suit from time to time. Thor got banished without his powers, and Captain America got bested by his best friend. Just because you're super powered doesn't mean that you're the best. They are a tool to help you help people. Unless, of course, you're Hydra, or in the case of the first 12 episodes, Centipede. Centipede is one of those villainous organizations, and they specialize in finding super powered people, amplifying their powers, getting answers to their serum, then letting those super powered people burn out. Unless they are of use to them, like Mike Peterson, which begs several questions to be sure. The first is what length of human experimentation is okay for superpowered people, or even people in general. We were appalled by Nazi experiments, but we're okay with experiments on superpowered beings? They experimented on Steve Rogers, but that was during wartime to a guy who was completely okay with doing anything to help the war effort. And when he did go behind enemy lines and save the day, he was congratulated on his success and crashed into the ice, only to be woken up in 2012 to Nick Fury saying, Welcome to the future, motherfucker. But experimenting on people to augment their powers, then blow them to pieces? What part of that is ethical? Even if they sign an agreement knowing that they could possibly die, playing on their emotions and promising them more is unethical in medical procedures, even if they are voluntary. And the name they gave this guy, Scorch. How do names change you as a person? Because it isn't like the naming of a superhero or a supervillain that's important here. What about names like slut, loser, creep, whore, or any other word made to be derogatory towards students, children, and adults, where they think that taking a gun and shooting up their school or their movie theater is okay. The name does something to you. And they give you a name. 
Trash can. Pizza face. Loser. Faggot. Loser. Weirdo. Spaz. Retard. You know, the name does something to you. It changes who you are. It alters your, your, your molecules. And one day you wake up and, and you look in the mirror and you don't recognize you anymore because you believe them. I win, you lose. You want to cry, please leave me alone, but nobody's listening because nobody cares because you don't have a name anymore because they took it away. And then one day, they say that name, and you hear something go snap. I crushed him! You realize what you gotta do. You gotta take back your name. And because of this name, you aren't going to try and be remembered? And the power of emotions. Ward in this episode about the Asgardian staff reacts to his past negatively as we see flashbacks to his childhood. Now, it doesn't justify his future actions, but it does provide insight on what emotions like rage hit in the staff do to non-superpowered beings. And speaking of the past, the future of Mike Peterson is shown after the explosion where they take Agent Coulson. He has a camera in his eye and he's being watched now. The people who do this have done this as an investment in the future, which becomes more prevalent in the second half of the season. And if we're talking about villains, we might as well talk about the titular organization that saves us from them, S.H.I.E.L.D. Strategic Homeland Intervention Enforcement and Logistics Division. And what does that mean to you? I mean, someone really wanted our initials to spell out S.H.I.E.L.D. But S.H.I.E.L.D. isn't without their flaws. The whole being a secret spy organization comes to mind, and when the agents are in the hub, it's essential that the information is compartmentalized by levels. Coulson is a high-level agent, and even he doesn't know things that Fury, Hill, or even his doctor knows about him. Sky learns about the short list of superpowered beings and questions it. How does S.H.I.E.L.D. know that these people want to be watched? Maybe they want their privacy. Maybe they just want normal lives. Secrets seem to be S.H.I.E.L.D.'s M.O. You think Fury's hiding something? He's a spy. Captain, he's the spy. His secrets have secrets. There are several incidents mentioned in the show, and Coulson even cites Miami at Sky to prove that no one heard about it other than S.H.I.E.L.D. Hell, the only reason people even know about the Battle of New York is because of the media. People filmed it and spread it. It was something that just couldn't be avoided. And when the team is at the hub, Sky breaks into the mainframe, finds out that there's no extraction for the team, and makes Coulson question what's happening. Does this mean that the military should always have an extraction plan for their special ops people? Is it even feasible? What's the alternative? Does the military just sacrifice these special ops people for the sake of the objective? How do you know if they've reached their full potential? And all of this leads back to the most prevalent thing of the first half of the season, Tahiti. It's a magical place. So remember when Agent Coulson got stabbed with a scepter by Loki because he was trying to stop the god from killing people? Yeah, afterwards he got sent to Tahiti. It's a magical place. And this secret was kept from him, even in the first episode by Commander Maria Hill when she converses with the doctor. Tahiti. He really doesn't know, does he? We can never know. What exactly would happen if he knew the circumstances of his recovery? And is the phrase, it's a magical place, his version of happy to comply, which occurs within Hydra? Hail Hydra. Hail Hydra! So Coulson embarks on a truth-finding mission that eventually leads him to his doctor who actually shows remorse for the procedure. And this makes you think about what you're willing to do to get those memories back. How far are you willing to go to get something you want so desperately back? Some of us go on rampages, some of us sulk about it, and some of us try to make amends. But in the end, as long as we do something to help ourselves, we feel as if we're doing the right thing, even if it hurts us in the long run. But how does the team function as a whole? They seem to have issues in the beginning, particularly with Skye and her loyalty to the Rising Tide versus S.H.I.E.L.D. And if you question the loyalty of your team members, how are you going to achieve your objectives? They do manage to do it, but they don't trust Skye until after Agent Coulson gets kidnapped and rescued by the team itself. Loyalty questioning is a human trait. It can happen at work, family, or even in relationships, but it's in almost every part of your life. But loyalty is not the only issue the team faces. How do you follow orders when someone you care about has their life on the line, like Coulson did with Gemma Simmons when she was infected with a virus from the Chitauri? There's also May and Coulson keeping secrets from Skye about her past, which is really interesting as there is a parallel with S.H.I.E.L.D. itself keeping secrets from Coulson. There's also the morality question to consider when it comes to the team. They don't have clearly defined lines. Ward is a special agent who would rather shoot first than ask if the mission was successful. Skye is clearly the street smarts and conscience of the team. Fitzsimmons has morality, but they don't express it unless they strongly object. 
In May, she doesn't like getting involved for the first nine episodes and keeps her distance from most of the others, save for Coulson. And speaking of, he's a big believer in second chances. The entire team uses quips and sarcasms as their crisis armor, or to get through a situation they deem hot-headed or uncomfortable. One of the things we really deal with in these episodes is death. And Coulson keeps bringing up that he was dead for 8 to 40 seconds. We see people get killed, whether superpowered or not, and we deal with Gemma Simmons jumping to her supposed death to save the team. All of these scenarios raise questions of lying to the people you love and respect. Is it justified when your life is on the line? Do you do it to protect them? Is it important to lie to them if you think they can help you? And the flip side of that is, do you stand by the person if they are about to die? Do you sacrifice yourself for them? Is it worth it? Fitzsimmons seems to think so. Battling the unknown is something that S.H.I.E.L.D. deals with every day, whether it be Centipede, Hydra, or the Rising Tide. Is free information a good thing? The Rising Tide thinks so, and there's even an episode where this is brought up. Miles, Skye's boyfriend, seems to be of the opinion that information should always be free, no matter what the consequences. Whereas Skye is starting to side with S.H.I.E.L.D. and actually wants to protect people. She doesn't think that giving out information is necessarily for the greater good, especially when it kills people. So does leaking information make it feed into the culture of fear? Not necessarily. For example, information can make people incensed. Look at the killings of black men around the United States. There are protests, and people are sharing information more now than ever before. Social media links us to the events as they unfold because everyone has a smartphone to record, snap a picture, or get some piece of information out to the world if their lives are in crisis. Organizational media doesn't seem to be the way to get the news anymore. Sure, people still read it, but now more than ever before, people are following hashtags and live streams, not newspaper and television reports. It could be out of fear, but I think it's more fear of not being told what's happening than anything else. And I think I'll leave you guys with this. The world is full of evil and lies and pain and death. And you can't hide from it. You can only face it. The question is, when you do, how do you respond? Who do you become? when we discuss Nazis, Hydra, and the moral implications of the second half of the season. Stop sleeping with Nazis!